science and technology. And her topic, I've already mentioned it, uh, and it's on the screen, researching um, biographies, the field resources and sources. And her, um, the topic, again, is funeral brochures, sources, resources, and relevance. Thank you, the floor, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So my presentation is starting. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I hope I don't raise more questions than answers with this. I'm going to share with you different scenarios. I had an auntie who was 90 years plus one day old when she passed on. And you could count on her for a funeral brochure if she attended a funeral. And even when she did not. Unfortunately, I never got around to asking her why she kept all her funeral brochures. Recently, we had to tidy her room and my cousin has thrown out half of the collection. Heartbreak for me. The second scenario, I had a presentation in the UK. And after the presentation, all that the archivists of the British archives had was funeral brochures. What are they in Ghana? And that made me decide to consciously collect and manage my collection better. The third one. A frantic phone call from my sister to update us about the administration of my late father's will. We had gone to court, and then one of the executors had passed on. He was not a blood brother, but he had been adopted by our grandfather. So the court asked, where is the evidence that he was one of you? We had to produce it. Thankfully, the most readily thing we found was the funeral brochure. Later, we found the obituary poster. Another frantic call, just a couple of months ago. My cousin in Zambia needed to renew his passports. Where were you domiciled, Ghana? Which house produced the documents? And since it was in my grandfather's house, he had to prove that my grandfather was indeed a Ghanaian. Where could we find details about his place of birth and his place of death and how old he was? We could not find my cousin's father's funeral brochure because he was, born, he was buried in the village. And though he knew his hometown, the hometown was not equal and is not equal to the place of birth. So we were stuck. This increased my resolve to be more attentive. But what is the funeral brochure? It seems to be a Christian consul, construct and it seems to be typically Ghanaian. I'm saying that because I have asked a few people, I've asked one Nigerian, you know, and he said, no, we don't have anything as elaborate as you have. And then my friend from Sierra Leone said, well, this is the kind of thing that we'll keep on the coffee table. We don't have this kind of thing in Sierra Leone. And I think it's also a Christian construct because Muslims, and by the nature of their religion, you cannot have a funeral brochure. I have not found one yet. I have, however, found um, tributes and short writings, articles about some Muslims. And I give examples of these, of one notable man, uh, Rahim Badamushi. He rose very high up in the education sector. And I'm yet to see one of a traditionalist. In fact, there was a woman in Teshi, 
that's my hometown, who lived to more than a hundred years, very influential person. But when she died, there was no brochure. And that was what I was chasing for my presentation at SCOMA. So I asked, why isn't there a brochure for her? They said, oh, she wasn't literate. And I said, but you could have written the brochure in Ga. Nobody thought about it. Are brochures just in Ga? Or are they not possible to be written in our mother tongues? That was a question I had to do. I had to answer. But funeral brochures are planned. Some of them may not plan them, but there are times when committees are set up, even if it is a two-member committee, to put together a brochure. Because the brochure maps out what has to be done during the church service at the graveyard, and sometimes even in the Thanksgiving service. And brochures vary in size and shape. I've seen some that are just about the size of a postcard, and I've seen volumes, two volumes. One was just um, a photo gallery of the person's life, two volumes. And there are various designs, some very simple, monocolor, some very elaborate, full color, even depending on who produces the brochure. And it depends on one standing in society. After all, it is part of the show to give someone a befitting burial. Funeral brochures are not mainline information sources in academia. They are considered ephemera. They are considered archival materials in some parts. But for us in Ghana, do we consider them archival materials such that we consciously collect and keep? For some of us, it may be the only documentation of our lives on earth. Everybody has a story. So sometimes families, even though the deceased may be illiterate, they will still go ahead and produce a brochure because of posterity. And they may contain just one little piece of the puzzle in your research. Olivaja says that they are a valuable resource and source of historical, social, and biographical information. I say that it goes beyond that. You have geography in there. You have photographs in there. You have politics in there. So as we put together the funeral brochures, what do we have in mind? Do we have a con a, a, an audience in mind when we put the contents together? How do we choose the information that gets in there and what we exclude? For myself, if you put me in a history class, I will not remember anything. But I have found that I am able to connect with the history of the country and people when I read the funeral brochures because I see more connections, the texture and the color, and the brick and mortar that makes the society go round. And as I read the funeral brochures, I'm fascinated by various things, the tributes, the biographies, the names of people and places, the photographs, the songs, the hymns, the quotations. And in this presentation, I share some of my um, insights of what I have gleaned in my collection. I have more than 600 copies of um, funeral brochures currently. <laughs> But I also tell you what you need to do as you read the funeral brochure. These are some of the um, ones I have collected, very few of them. 
And this is one that I found. I had two copies, but they had different covers. Same personality. And you can see the difference. Why does one have a color, full color cover, and the other one doesn't? We spend so much money, time, effort to put a funeral brochure together. If we spend all these resources putting them together, then they are not ephemera. They shouldn't be considered as trivia. In any case, printing presses make a lot of money from funeral brochures. That is one um, research that has to be done. Maybe I'll do it someday. But within the covers of the funeral brochure, you could have the prologue, you have definitely the program as the order of service, you have the life history, the biography, in some cases, the autobiography. And I've read just one funeral brochure with the biography written by the person. And then you have the tributes. As I read the funeral brochures, I was also mindful of the fact that there's a lot of funeral memorabilia. So some of them gave me pointers to funeral brochures that I had to look for. Others gave me more information that um, were need, was needed. I've also seen that funeral brochures nowadays come in all kinds of ways. And electronic social media is full of them. There are the hymns and the songs and the photographs, a special interest of mine, the quotations, you have the epilogue, and then the appreciation or the statement of acknowledgement. Why there's always a statement of acknowledgement at the end of the brochure? It was Professor Reynolds who told me that uh, before the funeral brochures, everything ended up at the, at the gravesite. And at the gravesite, a member of the family would be asked to give a vote of thanks. Now, those who do not go to the gravesite, what do they do? They will not hear the vote of thanks. So now it has been added to the funeral brochure at the very end. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the life stories and tributes. Um, Justice E.N.P. Soa, in his tribute to Nia Maulenu, said that a tribute does not say everything. It only gives glimpses of a person's life, usually from the perspective of the writer. And then there are some that are embellishments. Some are outright lies. Nowadays, you have tributes by children and individuals. <clears throat> so the, the, the tribute is, if he has 10 children, all the children will write their tributes. And that is because they relate to their father or their parents or the person differently. Life stories and tributes. What is in a name? I always heard of Niyama Olenu, the late Niyama Olenu, as somebody with that name, only to read the brochure to discover that he had an English name, Raphael. Peter Lajete had a native name. He was a chief somewhere where we will see a chief. Our own Reverend Professor Bidia. Until his death, I had no idea he was called Manasseh. And Atukwe Okai was also called John. Nama Okobuzia, the wife of um, Dr. Fabuzia, was called Victoria. And then there are the changes in names. Um, I share a few of those um, changing name of places, changing name of people like Atukwe. If you, sometimes the names, you haven't changed your name, but your name has just disappeared. The English name has disappeared. And then there are the nicknames. If you come from a place like Teshi, where everybody has what we call a guy name or a nickname, your nickname will be there. And sometimes 
they give information of who that person is. And there are different ways in which we have written the tributes and the life stories. Some of them are an essay, some of them have been letters. It's as if you are addressing the person who is deceased. Some of them are odes, some of them are poems. And I have seen one that was just a hymn. Not too long, just, it was the shortest I had seen. And then there are the tributes to, and the collections in the mother tongue. There's one from my late father, which Reverend Professor um, Philip Laie wrote. Until then, that was the first time I'd seen a tribute in the mother tongue, in my mother tongue. I'll share a little bit more about it. And then as I collected, I found this one, which was a newspaper, the one on the right, was actually a newspaper. It was about 12 pages of, the, of a newspaper. And that was the tribute, also written in tree. And then there are the odes and the poems. The left one for my late mother, in which my niece wrote. And then there's one from Atukwe Okai's daughter, written in English. Very much like how her father would have written that. And then recently, I found this other one of another person, and it was in a Santi tree. But for this one, he even put it in context. COVID, why COVID has deprived them of having a big funeral. The funeral was held in April. COVID has deprived them of doing the show that their deceased father and relative deserved. And then this is the hymn as a tribute. It had me asking many questions. Why this particular hymn? Under what circumstances did they meet? And who is Manya X? She will forever remain a mystery if we do not go looking for her. But where will we find her? In Peckham or in Ghana? Is she Ghanaian or is she British? But then there's also the absence of tributes. My own mother said she didn't want a funeral brochure. So finally, we had to do a cross between a brochure and um, a tribute and um, a life history. Um, but some people are very particular. They don't want a funeral brochure. And this was what Mrs. Alberta Olin the wife of Niyama Olin said she did not want one. And if they were going to do any at all, then she did not want any tributes. So there's, there are no tributes in her funeral brochure. Instead, they were replaced by songs. And I hear she chose every song that was in the funeral brochure. There's this question about tributes. And sometimes you will read funeral brochures and you realize that it is totally false. There have been instances when people, and I think they have some of the funeral contractors, they have lifted the life of somebody else and put it in somebody who is not so well known and said that it is the person. In fact, in our own circumstances at Acrofi Crystal, I remember when one of our colleagues died, uh, Eja Apente, and we had to put together a funeral brochure for him. When we went for the funeral, the memories is, ah, but he doesn't go to church. How did it come that this is his favorite name? But that was how we knew him. We wrote our tribute because of how we knew him. 
the perspective we had when we had related to him. But then there are also the other ones, the brutally frank ones. And Doreen Hammond shares this one in her column. Her father-in-law has not been forgiven for what he said in his friend's funeral. This is what she said. After wiping his tears and clearing his, his throat, he said, the gentleman lying here today is a good friend and we have passed through thick and thin. And all I ask of you today is to pray for our sinful souls <clears throat> so that the good Lord will forgive us our sins. Lord, we fornicated, drank a lot of alcohol, gossiped and consulted deities in our bid to become rich. He did not finish his tribute. He was bundled out of the place amidst all kinds of reactions. So do you give the tribute or you don't give the tribute? He gave his perspective of his training and what they had written inside the funeral brochure was certainly not his friend. And then there are the newspaper columns too, where you will find some of the things. You will not find the full brochure, but the things that you are looking for, the ancillary things, will lead you into getting the funeral brochure. And so as I did my writing and my research, I also read a lot about tributes in the funeral, in the, in the newspapers, newspaper columns, and that um, other places. Here are a few of them. Um, tributes in the electronic media. So you will not only find them in the funeral brochure. It means that there are things that are outside the funeral brochure which we need to be mindful of. This is a story about somebody who changed his name. It was borrowed from his friend who he had promised he would name his son after. And so he changed the son's name. What is in the name? And then there's this one. I'm looking for this funeral brochure. And the person is in Accra. I will go. There's a change of name somewhere there. The original name is Kootin. K-O-O-T-I-N. But we know of somebody called Rose Mensa Kutin. K-U-T-I-N. Where did the name change appear? Follow the lead, look at the small print. These are some of the things you look out for as you read around and um, in the funeral brochure. Because mind you, you will go to Kutin and not realize that it is Kutin's family you are also talking about. So who was he? That 40 years after his death, there should be um, a memorial for him. And on the left side, there's a long list of descendants that have passed. So they use him, they name him, they name 16 others, and then they are having a ceremony. I wonder how they celebrated this 40th anniversary. Was there another funeral brochure or was there a memorial brochure more, more like? And I've seen a few like that, which should trigger you to go back looking for the previous funeral brochure if there was one. Here are a few others, uh, tributes in print. I was looking for the funeral brochure of Hugh Masakela. I don't think there will be one. I don't think there is one, uh, but I'm still looking. I'm hopeful. And I share with you in the next couple of slides, some of the glimpses um, from, you know, about people from the funeral brochures I have read. I had no idea that the Accra High School was founded by a Sierra Leone. And it was just this morning I got to know his, um, the times when he lived. 
I got to know also that Niyama um, Olenu was involved in mainline academia, even though he was a thorough lawyer. And his speciality was in land law. That Peduasi village, just down the hill from the Kupon, was founded by one of his ancestors. And that there's a place called Philadelphia House in La. Why Philadelphia House? Place names, names of places, names of people, and um, what are their significance? Um, it was also in his funeral brochure that I realized that a greater Accra was became greater Accra as a region in 1982 under the PNDC. But I found the detail of the creation of the greater Accra region in Professor Adofene's work, Abrewanana. So one of the rare things, I've never seen it anywhere, the inclusion of Nyama Olenu's CV in his funeral brochure. And there was only one woman on the planning committee. Why was that? I also talked about the one for Akwaje, where he was born. He was also a journalist and published two newspapers. I'm yet to find out which of the newspapers, the names of the newspapers he published. I also learned that he was the one who prepared the petition for the ex-servicemen, um, which led to the 28th February incident. And that he helped in the founding of Laboni Secondary School and Nungwa Secondary School. My question then was, why did he skip Peshin, which is between La and Nungwa? What was our crime? And the author of these two books, um, The African Dream and the Life and Work of Alfred, George Alfred Grant. I'm interested in the second one because the university in which I currently work has been named after Pa Grant. And so we are going to start collecting things about Pa Grant and, and building an archive for him. But Dr. Akwaje was also called Neneba, from where, by who, under what circumstances did he get this name? And then there are details of his achievements that were included, two pages, and he adds more information about the Kulungugu affair, the bomb throwing at Kulungugu. This is one from one of my friends, um, Angela Gamina Bwaje's mother. She graciously gave me a copy of a mother's funeral brochure. Um, typical Presbyterian, but for her, the, what is it about her? That there were ministers from both, you know, Orthodox and charismatic backgrounds, traditions. And I learned about the appellations of Oforiwa. I've never heard of it. I didn't know that these were appellations or that Oforiwa was um, um, a, a beautiful name that attracted these names, appellations. And what do the appellations mean? The use of gold by a midwife in the birthing chamber. What do we use gold for? Apart from the jewelry we see, how did it end up in the birthing chamber? Um, and then there are the tributes from the, 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 the clergy and from the whole thing was put together by the family. Uh, it was one of the grandchildren who put together, who designed the brochure. But for a staunch Presbyterian, I was surprised that there were only two hymns. 
in the brochure? Who chose the themes? Were they his, her personal choices or they were hints that she laughed, so they were included? Why all the other hints? Stunt Presbyterian, you choose only two themes for her and put it in the brochure. But I also hear that there's a, she was writing a book. I can't wait to read the history of Ghana from her perspective, even though she is gone. And then about Kofi Annan, um, one of the hardest uh, funeral brochures I have sought. I still don't have an original copy. I have a photocopy. Um, and I realize that there are different versions. For example, there's one that the University of Ghana did, um, the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Center also has one. And then there's a smaller version that circulated, and then there was a more voluminous one with all the tributes from people around the world, the dignitaries around the world. Um, the pity sayings throughout the brochure, um, there was an ode, um, which I'm looking for the author, Doris A. Kuon. I also realize that there's a group called the elders. And when you read it, it is quite facilitating. Uh, and that he loved red, red. From Alberta Oledu's funeral brochure, there is no biography, there are no uh, tributes because she stated it. And so they left it the way it is. Um, what they did rather was to put all the tributes and the biography together, available and made it available and put it online. However, it is no longer available because you can't keep paying for time on the cloud with this um, material. It costs money to do it, so it has been pulled down. How it is available to others later is something that is debatable. Um, and then for her, the pithy sayings were not taken from all over. They were taken just from Michael Powell. Why just him? There must be something worth delving into from that. But I noticed that they all had to do with generosity. This was a woman who was generous to a fault. And it showed in everything from one page one to the very last page. All the hints that were put in there were her personal choice. She had made how she wanted it done, and it was obeyed. But what struck me was also the beautiful arrangement of the hymns. When we walk with the Lord, and the last one was, abide with me. Insightful. And then the one from my own father. I got to know the names of some of his classmates. And like I said, it was the first time seeing a tribute in Ghana. And... How seriously do we take our mother tongues? Serious enough to script because it is from there that you can speak everything that you want. It touches the soul. It also included a folk tale which I had never heard. And there was also the fact that the ode to him was not included in the brochure because there was separate in the meeting. Also missing was a, uh, the tributes by the in-laws, which was through no fault of this. It was mine. And I have lived to regret it because the first question was, where is our tribute? The first question that came to me from my in-law was, where is our tribute? I couldn't answer. Darocha, political figure. Um, I thought Sunday school had to do with church. I read his work and I realized that Sunday school had nothing to do 
with the church. He was one of the founding members of the Ghana Law School and um, he was one of the people who was involved in the tussle between the Evangelical Church of Ghana and then the split in the EP Church. So it is worth following on. And then now more Kobuzia. This is the last one I have read thoroughly. Victoria was her full name. She was a midwife. Um, and she was quite instrumental in the design of the Progress Party's logo. She was also instrumental in the, um, the putting up of the Kaneshi uh, market. But there were three different stories about how she met Dr. Buzia. One says that they met in Takwa here. Yeah. Another says that they met in Akuse. And then her classmates say that they met in Kumasi. Which one do we believe? Perhaps the children will tell her. Because the Takwa one is the most probable. The nephews say it is Akuse. The classmates say it is Kumasi. The Progress Party's mm -hmm. idea was committed to health. And this led them into rural health care. It appears she was very instrumental in the establishment of um, rural clinics. And um, we should remember that the late professor himself was very much into rural development as a sociologist. So I beg your pardon. Um, that's it from some of the things I have gathered from the uh, some of the funeral brochures I have heard, I have read. Now, where do we find them? They are in our backyards. They are in our homes, they are in boxes, but where should they be? If they are all around us, why are we not making use of them? And we have talked a bit about archives earlier today and from yesterday. The churches, if it is a Christian construct, then the churches should be looking at collecting them more consciously. There's a story of one church in my place, Teshi, where somebody, they had just piled piles, lots of funeral brochures. And then one day, uh, the cleaner decides that it was all junk and sets the whole thing on fire. About 40 years collection up in flames. Special collections in libraries. Acrophy Crystalla comes back into mind. If we have set up to do this, how do we develop our special collections? I have started special collections in this place. The number of staff who have died, I have started collecting their funeral brochures. If we all collected a little and put them, you can't have all the space, and put them in a depository in an institution, it would be useful to others. There are associations that people belong to. They can also do their bit of collection. The Institution of Engineers, for example, has a modest collection of eminent engineers who pass on. And then there are the personal collections of friends. And in our own houses, Ebusuanfi and Shia, the way you belong to. Is it just going to do the funeral, collect the, um, the poster, and that is the end? We should be more consistent because if the church doesn't have it, the, your, the way or, or the house you belong to should have it. And because funeral brochures are not considered mainline 
information sources. It means that archives should collect and preserve them. But how many of our institutions have archives? The same way we have personal libraries, we should also be thinking of having personal archives. The museums should also be there. As you collect the artifacts, what are the um, connections between the artifacts and the people? How do you read a funeral brochure? Where? When? I find that depending on where I read it, I get some more information. But if you are going to use it as a piece of research, um, then you have to read it like any other information. You treat it like any other information. You read it keenly and with skepticism. Yesterday, Professor Dupinin said that. Maureen also said that with discernment and intuition or intuition. We have to take note of that. And then you take notes as you go along. I have digital copies of funeral brochures, but I still want the hard copy because it's easier for me to make notes as I go along. As you go along reading and you are making notes, it helps you to see the differences in the narrative. And, and that will help you to do a more diligent work. But do not use the funeral brochure alone, as I have said. Um, the obituary announcement and what is in the name is there. You omit the name of somebody in the funeral, um, the poster, and there's trouble. Even the arrangement is another political statement in the family. But they are very useful. And then there are also tributes. You are saying something, but you end up not saying something. And why are you not saying what you are not saying? And um, apologies to Professor Walsh. You are not saying something, but why are you not saying what you are not saying? And how do you read it? Where do you read it? You read it on the funeral grounds and leave it there, or you take it home and you read it later and dissect it. Um, I used to do that, just read it at the funeral grounds and leave it, you know, just put it there and collect. Until um, my father's funeral, when I had a call from somebody, and my friends, my classmates, mother, and she said, Oklu, do you know we have the same great grandfather? I said, what? She said, yes. The same great-grandfather you have is also my great-grandfather. We were friends, but we were also relatives. We didn't know until she read that funeral brochure. So I'm talking about reading beyond the covers. Be mindful of the fact that you do not use the funeral brochure as a source alone, because it gives you a lot more. If you are going to get a lot more from the funeral brochure, then you have to read beyond the covers. Because there are always unwritten aspects. The sermon, for example, is not there. The music that is played, um, especially for the collection, uh, or when they are having the offertory, is not included. But the choice of the music is important. The conversations that happen around are also part of the information you should be mindful of if you happen to be at the funeral grounds. Are the contents of the, of the brochure the desire of the deceased? Did he write his own brochure or did he plan it? Did he put everything in place? And did he also say that when I die, I don't you want anything from you in my funeral brochure. Nobody should come there. Some people have said that people are even dictators in death by saying that I want nothing to do with you. And these are the things that I want when I die. Who should play the piano, which song you should sing, in what tune, and all that. Sometimes it can be that elaborate. 
Now, in the funeral brochure, sometimes the dates of the funeral of the burial will be included. In these COVID times, it is not common to find it. They may have, have the funeral brochure, but it will not include the dates. So it is not every time that you will find the dates there. If there is no dates, then that is a cause for further research. And you also use it, like I've said, with other um, documents. There are manuscripts, there are receipt books, there are membership cards, all these have to be done. And I have just shared with you some of the things you use with the funeral brochures. This is another one, funeral memorabilia, the souvenirs, key rings, um, CDs, crockery, bags, bottled water. It is all there. And these, when you get, will give you pointers. They are just including the bio data, date of birth, date of death. That is all. But if you get hold of such a thing, now you have to go back looking for the funeral brochure because you want to know more about the person. There are also the fabric, all kinds of things. Beyond the covers, I have shared some of these things. And then nowadays, we also have the, uh, the one week celebration, <coughs> which you shouldn't lose sight of. And then the memorial celebrations as well. I'll go back to this one. Um, there was one about somebody who appended his signature to the first bank notes. And I know from my study of the Ghana currency that the governor is the person, the governor of the bank is the one who appends his signature on the bank notes. So how is it that the director of the bank, one of the directors, in the Bank of Ghana is said to have appended a signature. It is something I am trying to follow. I hear the family is in Kumasi of Edward Osei, and I intend following up to ask how come the director had his name on the bank notes. Beyond the covers are also the plaques. In our churches, and you will find them there. And once you find them, you have to go looking for the paper documents and hope that you can find it. And these are plaques that I found in Cape Coast, the Wesley Cathedral, one of the oldest churches. It has a plaque of a very young person. You wouldn't find plaques of young people but it was there. Why did she merit a plaque? What were the circumstances of her death? If you are writing about people, all these things are important. But the most easy one to find is the funeral brochure or the poster. And then we come to the photographs freezing into time. I am particularly fascinated because when you look at the photographs in some of the funeral brochures, you can tell how much the Lord has been good, the grace of God from one stage to the other. And how do you read the photographs? And for me, I have found the, the, the one on Nama um, Okobuzia, very fascinating because she was one of the people, or if not the person, who made the wearing of the kaba, the Ghanaian kaba, and slip very popular. And so you look at it, and it is a must, I'm sure, for a seamstress who is into making these things because you can see all the styles in there. Um, you see the development, you see another aspect of the evidence 
of the text you are reading. But do the photographs, depending on how many and how glossy, will they detract or add on to the information that you are reading? And then there are the in remembrance. There are several of them too. Also sometimes coming in brochures or sometimes just as postcards. I've talked about the Kutin family. Um, and then there was an instance in my family where my cousins organized a memorial for their parents. They had to borrow a hymn book, a Presby hymn book, and include, you know, choose songs their, 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 their parents liked. And my question was, why didn't you use the funeral brochures of, you know, when they died? Because the hymns are still there. And we are yet to have that conversation. These are some of the um, images of the memorials. Um, notices in newspapers and also as um, brochures. This is the one I talked about as um, the governor who appended, uh, the, the, the director who appended his signature. So the photographs are part of our history, social cultural history, and we cannot ignore them, whether they detract or put um, add more information. We need to ensure that we also read them as we read the text. And then the hints and other songs. This part is distilled from a paper I presented um, some three years ago. Um, do the songs just happen? Are they chosen? Is it the choice of the person? Is this a choice of the family? Is it the choice of the church? And um, what do we do? And why are there so many mournful songs? If we are Christians and we have hope in the resurrection, why is it that we have a hoho in Manfreni and we are so mournful about it? And yet there are songs like Abide With Me, so upward. We know the Lord will abide with us. And then Besob in Sajijebe is very perpetual in Edekriapim Christ Church. You sing it all the time. And yet it is a song that is so much full of hope. And so the debate is, are they out of place? Are there songs for the living or for the dead? Are they eschatological or they are evangelical? They could be both. But let us not gloss over the hymns that are in the funeral brochures. And I have also learned some new songs as I have gone round um, my research. Sometimes the songs are a whole sermon in themselves. So do not believe all you read. There are legal issues. How do you quote them? But cross-check the information you have. Use them with other materials. Read between the lines. Read the fine print. Use the oral sources. There's also the unscripted. If something is missing, why is it missing? There was a, an instance in which we contacted somebody for a funeral, uh, for a tribute, and her response was, she did, my friend did not want one. I will obey her instructions. I will not do it. So she refused to write a tribute for the friend that everybody knew. She said, I will obey her instructions. But in all these, the things that surround the person, the memorabilia, the most common being the funeral brochure, have to be taken together. You cannot take one and leave the other. One thing will lead you to another thing so that you get a fuller picture of the person you are studying. There are so much, many, many things that are around us which we are neglecting. A funeral brochure, the next time you won't toss it out into the bin because that may be the only thing about somebody. 
Even if it's false, why is it false? Where you read it, some people will read it from cover to cover. I will look at the photographs first, and then I'll look at the biography, and then I'll look at the hymns, and then I'll look at the printer. Because even in the printing, they are great. Are you reading it for pleasure? Or you are re reading it for research? If you are just reading it for pleasure, as a scholar, please start reading it for research. So here are some, some, some concluding thoughts. Who put it together? What are the contents? Why choose something over the other? Everything in there is a pointer to more information. It is just a perspective. What are the other sides of the story? Keep your ears to the ground. Follow up with people. Some people may even not be named, but they are there. What is absent is also important. Funeral brochures may be labeled as trivia and ephemera. But if you spend time and resources and effort in putting them together, then they have to be considered seriously and by all researchers. And on that note, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, <laughs> Auntie Koklu, especially for your concluding thoughts. And that which was said a little earlier, just before that, yes. how we should uh, use the funeral brochures with skepticism. But you went even beyond the funeral brochures to uh, plaques and um, um, other documents that are put together for memorials and so on. Thank you very much. All right, so the floor is now open initially for clarifications. Then uh, we'll go on to other things of more substance. You may also put your question in the chat box. Dr. Walton. Yes. Dr. Sulisad, um, go ahead. Yes. Um, sorry, uh, the first presentation, I didn't have the opportunity to ask questions because I was on a different uh, um, platform, but uh, I'm happy to ask my question now. I, I put what I wanted to say to Auntie Maureen. But I want to say thank you to my sister Boklu for the presentation. And just to say that um, the, there's a practical uh, reason why the Muslims cannot make use of this brochure. That's because they are not supposed to keep the body for long. So, and to find the brochure, you need a lot of consultation get mm -hmm. to meet together and so on. So you need no less than one, one week, two weeks, and so on. And, I uh, also work in the church. I see how they need to go here and there, consult the church, get all documents, a lot of things before a brochure can be can be uh, put together. But it was good to know that this brochure can be important. And uh, one of the interesting things I've just also realized is, it is when someone dies that you know all the names. Uh, other than that, you don't know all the hidden names. Thank you for sharing. Thank you on her behalf. Yes, any others? Please, please don't. I thought it's the extent of my hand that is not going. I don't know how that can be. Can I ask? Is, it, is this Reverend Maxell? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Yes, Your yes. hand is up. Oh, well, yes. Just a minute. Before you, Auntie Maureen is also. And she, she also has, has her hand her hand up. Thank you, Chair. 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 Hello. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Koklu, for your um, presentation. So much in it. So, so much. Not so little time. Anyway, well done. 
Did you say you have a collection of 600? Yes. Funeral brochures? Yes. I see. I don't mean for money. I see. Okay. Quite a morbid habit, eh? I don't know what to say. <laughs> And um, you, you've collected these over how many years? Um, consciously, I've done that over the past four years. Unconsciously. Okay, that's a lot in four years. Yeah. That's a lot. Okay, well done. I'll have other questions later. Okay. Well done. Well done. Thank you very much, and to Maureen, um, Reverend Reverend Ba, we'll go ahead. Yeah, Auntie KK, we are grateful for this insightful presentation. This is, in fact, ingenuity, heading on areas that others have never thought of. Uh, something that is very, very uh, striking about it is the issue of names that you, you pointed out that so many people have different things in their name. I remember when I came to Ghana and I talked about Kofi Atta Anand, I was surprised that a few of my mates there did not understand that one of uh, Kofi Anand's name was Atta. They were surprised. I said that is a name that we have in my family. My grandfather was called Atta, and Kofi Atta Anand had that same name, the same spelling. But uh, the, the, what I wish to find out, you may mention in your presentation that there are funerals where the bushes, we have multiple bushes. Even though you are doing collection, I know that part of your research, perhaps after doing the collection, will be what happens before the production, maybe what goes beyond. Like uh, Dr. Sulesa has talked about consultation with families and so on. So, what accounts for, for numerous bushes in one funeral? One person has died, and now there are different funeral bushes, especially the Christian milieu where the liturgy is infused within that ritual. So how do we come about having many, uh, have you made any investigation on that? How do we come about many bushes for one funeral? And how do they manage the situation? Does it bring conflict? How, is, how does it go about? Okay, I, I have a feeling sometimes um, we don't make enough for starters or the, 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 the printer ran out of um, maybe ink. And so the, <laughs> instead of printing full color, there's, there's, you know, a way of making up for the next. Sometimes it is just, um, you know, printing um, some mistake. Because you could also find funerals which have some pages missing. It could be in the printing process. It is not deliberate. It is just maybe the way the work has come out. So you, all kinds of things can happen. You could run out of revenue. Uh, you could have made um, an order for fewer than you thought. You would have um, made some for different calibers of people who would turn up. Um, all kinds of things, and that merits more re research, I think. I haven't yet gone into that. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Professor Lai, your turn. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Auntie Kiki. Um, it, it, is, it is striking what you say about the funeral brochure being uniquely Guinean, and that you haven't discovered this in um, other um, regions in Africa or countries in Africa. Uh, and also for the fact that it is a Christian idea. Um, I want you to, to throw a bit more light on that, uh, the uniqueness. Um, is it just Africa or is it you know, other countries, including probably the West East. And uh, if that is the case, you know, what are the origins? Uh, in Ghana, if it is uniquely Christian, um, have you 
gone further to do some kind of uh, uh, investigation to know when it all started. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Prof. Lai. Um, that is the one thing I want to know when we started producing funeral brochures and why it is one of the areas I think I have to delve into. So I keep going back and um, looking for the earliest. I think the earliest I have is around 1963. Um, I'm yet to look at my auntie's collection to see if she has more and which predates my 1963. Um, I am um, Christian consul construct in Ghana. It will be helpful to know what happens in Nigeria, for example. Um, Sierra Leone, they've said that, no, they don't do it. But maybe it is also because of maybe the ethnic group you come from. And if it is Christian, then the Christianity, the religion overrides the ethnicity. And therefore, it will be worth looking at that kind of literature if it's also available. Um, Nigeria is one target. Um, Sierra Leone is the other because of the Christian collection. Um, the West, I've had somebody say that there's something like that in, I think it was China. I think it was China, she said, when I shared, first shared the paper. Um, but we haven't talked since we, 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 we parted ways. But certainly, I will look at when we started and the earliest funeral brochure I can find. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Um, Dr. Maureen's hand is up again. Dr. Maureen. Um, yes, um, Koklo. Yes. You wanted to know what happens in uh, in Nigeria. I think we, we do have uh, funeral brochures, and we can have really elaborate ones, yeah. uh, like you do in Ghana. Okay. In fact, during the break, uh, after my presentation, before you came on, a friend was telling me that uh, the Catholic Church, uh, at least in the southeast of Nigeria, has uh, decided to stop all uh, brochure funeral brochures. So mm. if people want to print brochures, then they cannot be distributed during the service or on the uh, inside the church building or the premises. But mm. they can do that at the reception venues or in the homes. Okay. So that's uh, what I had. But we do have uh, funeral brochures. I remember I coordinated the one when my father died in 20, uh, 2002. Mm. Uh, but we just had the hymns and his uh, biography. There were no tributes. Oh, okay. And Dr. Mugambi is indicating that they have them in, in Kenya also. Oh, okay. Uh, and I don't know about Dr. Settles. You, you mentioned about overlapping of foreign opera practices um, in, in the U.S. Anyway, thank you. Um, we have also, um, Dr. Ago Mensa has hand up. So, Dr. Ago Mensa, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mommy, thank you so very much for your presentation. Thank um, you. Yeah. The I, I I remember when I was I was doing some work on the Bediaku. I before then I used to think that uh, he came from this place because I was told he was buried here, and so I I went to look for his funeral brochure and I realized that he came he actually came from the central region, and he even stayed in Accra. And so it's, it's, it's very important uh, we pay attention to some of these materials. But I, want, I wanted to ask this, uh, many of these funeral brochures, uh, many of them 
uh, guessworks. Uh, when I say guessworks, uh, in fact, things that are, uh, have to do with the diseased. Sometimes those who are composing the the material, they do a lot of guesswork because the person is dead. They, there are some things they, 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 they wanted to know they didn't know. So they would just put anything there to just make the literature nice to read. Now, when you are handling such a material, uh, you said we have to be skeptical. But where do you draw the lines? And, uh, if you have if you have seen an information you want to use, uh, do you go back to the family to be sure that uh, the information you are going to use is is very accurate? Because uh, I have been in a, I have written a lot of funeral brochures for family members, and sometimes when you are handicapped, you 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 are tempted to draw on your own knowledge about the person and it may not reflect the exact uh, uh, you know fact about the, the disease and so where where do you draw lines when you have to use such a material in your write-up and well, then uh, the, the second question is i don't mm -hmm. know uh, how maybe your definition of a brochure um, has only to do with writing a book because uh, keeping records even about the dead is an ancient practice. Uh, if you read many of the, the accounts, especially some of the biblical accounts, records were kept about the dead and all that, um, but not in the, in the same manner we are doing it today. And so when you talk about brochure, uh, are you perhaps talking about records in general, records that are kept about the dead and all that, or what we know today as the written form of, of, of information. And so that, that's my, my, my second leg of question. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, faithful El Elion. Um, the second question first. The funeral brochure is a publication, is a product of records that have been put together. So you may have put the funeral brochure by consulting different kinds of documents. You may have consulted photographs, you could have consulted um, manuscripts, you would have consulted diaries, you'd have um, picked up, you know, different things about the person, artifacts that the person used. And these are the things that you put together to produce the funeral brochure. And that is only produced when the person is dead. So you are drawing information from different sources and putting together. And that is why when you are reading the funeral brochure, you are actually going out to look for resources, other sources that diverge from the products you are holding. So I hope that answers your question. It is a publication. It could be one page. It could just be a sheet. Um, but typically, it is a booklet. The other aspect of your question, um, we've talked about the embellishments. We've talked about, but why are you making up something? Write what you know. <laughs> it is your perspective. And, and if you have to research, you are asking other people. So it is not just one person you are asking. If there are different sides of a person, you need to know as many of the sides as you can. And then it is for you to draw your conclusion. If you want the fun side of the person to show in your work, then it is a fun side of the person you use. That does not make the person less of a person because somebody else is focusing on the political side of the same person. Do I Thank you very you? much. 
Okay. Thank you, Thank you Moby. Prof, Thank you. Prof Walls, Prof Walls, Prof Walls, you have the floor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want oh, to. Uh -huh. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, want to thank Koklu uh, so much for this uh, splendid presentation, um, and for what it draws attention to: the importance of what you might call the ephemeral uh, material uh, for a historian's task. We have a terrible tendency to think in academic terms of academic books and, uh, 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 and of printed sources that are verifiable. Uh, and these are always valuable. But when we are dealing with human life. It's the materials of human life that cast light uh, uh, on uh, what we are seeking. So the funeral brochures, I think, are most important. And uh, Cochlear has done wonderful work on this over the uh, over the years. Uh, there. Um, so many other things all around us. Churches produce an enormous amount of paper. It's important to collect that paper, to catalogue it, to maintain it. Uh, these are valuable sources of information that just are left behind, as it were, by the ordinary events of human life or of church life political life. Uh, so uh, I just make this plea for keeping a wide range of sources when we're dealing with biographical or indeed any historical uh, historical uh, study. Uh, Koklo mentioned uh, one thing which uh, is of particular interest to me. Uh, the inscriptions that occur in churches. Uh, the, uh, an enormous amount of information is really given in those inscriptions. And there are also the things which you can draw um, it, that tell you something about the church, the, about the background, about the times uh, in which this this person lived, uh, I uh, have a collection uh, made in Sierra Leone. Uh, when was it? In the in the uh, uh, in the the early the early sixties, it would be of a thousand. Uh, memorial inscriptions in Freetown churches. Uh, I'm amazed at the amount of material that that throws up, not just the biographical material of those people, but what it tells you about Freetown over, uh, uh, over a long period, uh, uh, col uh, colonial and post-colonial, uh, of how churches operated. Uh, of how people uh, how people connected. Um, many of those buildings are no longer there now. Uh, I think collection of this sort of source material is uh, immensely important, and uh, I think the talk we've had today uh, draws welcome attention to it. Uh, so. Many thanks. I've been reminded in the discussions about um, skepticism um, that um, the great 18th century English scholar, Dr. Johnson, said, 
a man is not on oath in memorial inscriptions. <laughs> <laughs> and that may be worth uh, yeah, worth yeah. Doing. Yeah, mine is not on road. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, thanks, Pro. Thanks. Um, next um, online is um, Reverend Hansen Akufi Ansan. Thank you, Dr. Um, Walton. So I I'm, I'm, want to make a, just a little contribution to what our sister has done today. I think it's very original and it's very comprehensive. And we thank her for the eye opener. Uh, I want to say that, yes, it's a very valuable source of history. And uh, I've read a few of my ancestry and I've been enlightened. I was also recently acquainted with a book, Building a Nation, Seven Notable Ghanaians. The first one of which was on the life of Justice Anidi Age, Nibaita, done by Deborah Atubra and Abed Audoba of Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana. And they constructed the life of this woman, they said, mainly from the funeral brochure, from various aspects of the funeral brochure. So what her sister is saying is true. Now, I say comprehensive because when she began, I started listening to some of the challenges that the funeral brochure presents. And I noticed that she mentioned all of them also. The outright lies. I was familiar with the lies when uh, somebody I know very well uh, died in the US and they were com uh, compiling the brochure in Ghana. And everything they put there actually didn't fit. It wasn't the life of the person. Uh, she spoke about the embellishments, which are also true. Um, but I noticed that sometimes names are added to the brochures. Somebody has about three children, and then maybe in the euphoria or wanting to let the brochure look good, uh, cousins will add to the name. So you pick it and really it's a distortion. And I want to know how I mean, we can go about doing this. A few times to, it gives a history of the clan and the prominent people in the clan, but then some may be omitted. Yes, as she also said that uh, the in-laws, uh, uh, tribute was omitted from a brochure and it gave her trouble. So uh, although she has spoken about skepticism, I'm interested in the names, the, the names, especially of children. How do you go about sorting this thing out? Thank you. Yeah, and take off very yeah. briefly. Yes, um, can you repeat that part about children? I'm not sure I got you properly. Yeah, that um, the deceased may have about three children. And mm -hmm. then in the area of compiling the brochure, more cousins are added. So you check it and you have eight children, sometimes 12 children. But the biological children may really be about four. How, have you come across that and how did you deal with that? No, I haven't come across that. But you see, in some of our uh, um, ethnic groups, um, everybody is your child. So you can't treat me as a cousin. I, and then I have what I have encountered is somebody who did not have children and um, in the funeral brochure, they said he had one child and the murmurs in the congregation was something else. But I have also um, come across and my own grandmother, the one I, I grew up to know as my grandmother, she didn't have biological children. And in the obituary, they wrote, no biological children, no children. Was that important? In our house, if nobody told you that she was my, mother, my father's stepmother, nobody knew because she treated the children, the grandchildren, everybody who came to the house as equal. So um, it, it depends. You know, you can name the people, but 
if the other people are named, named are cousins or nephews, then sometimes it shows the how close the affinity is. I am this person, I call him my father, I call him my mother. There are some people who were raised by their aunties and uncles. And so they give that allegiance to the people who, it is not about blood. Sometimes it is about the ties that bind. So they said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a child, I'm, I'm the child, but I'm not the child. Blood, I'm not the child, but I am the child. What do you do? The records will say something. Traditionally, the records will be different. Um, administratively, in you know, legal terms, the records will be different. So there are all those nuances that we have to, you know, take care of. There are currents that, as you do the research, you will realize that this person is actually sometimes they are not even blood brothers, like we have in our case. You know, the person has an other name. And when he died, we were all there. Somebody said, but how is that other name, Ahiable, in the Lai family? I said, but he is my uncle. That is what we call him. My grandfather adopted him. So his family, when we are doing things, we call them. Have I made you confused more? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it presents problems, but... Uh, we'll resolve it as society grows. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello? Uh, Kokulu, I can hear you, but I don't know why a lot of people are I can't, I can't hear. I can't hear anybody. Can I just you, got can you hear me? me. Yes, I can hear you now. Please, oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. I can now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It seems the, the, the internet had a little issue up here, so the ICT is addressing it. Oh, okay. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yes, I'm here. You have a question? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to address my question to uh, uh, Dr. Settles. I think uh, so. I, I was asking permission from the, the moderator, uh, Dr. Walton. Appears he's not here. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Then, then when he comes back online, then I can. Um. I can ask my question. So now we are like sheep gone astray. There's no moderator. <laughs> it looks like a cockroach. Yes. Maybe maybe your next publication should be along the lines of how to. How to write um, um, how to prepare a funeral brochure with insights from you know is it hundred years you've covered or more? 
Abraham. That is one task I don't relish. Well, but it's so insightful, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we we you know we just look at these things and go. <sighs> I'll see what I'll I see can what do. Sure. sure. Hello. 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 Oh. Hello. Well, many many of us connected in in some way. Hello. Yes, we are here. I can now um, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe a quick one before <clears throat> I move to my main question. Uh, uh, the one I said I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Settles. Uh, something I, I wanted to put on suggestion uh, that, uh, like uh, Dr. Abraham suggested, if you can run a workshop on how to write brochures, funeral brochures especially, uh, you can um, you can do so with some um, corporate or, or organizations. They can sponsor you to do that. Uh, maybe if you write a, a few proposals to them, uh, they can come to your aid and provide provide you with funds to be able to organize such a workshop. Uh, for me, that will go a long way uh, to help people to do or write better brochures, funeral brochures, uh, because people don't have the skills, you know, they just put things together. And so um, this is my, 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 my humble suggestion, mommy. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, mommy. Mm. I, I don't know whether they are back on, so I can ask my question. Yes, Prof. Walton has a few more challenges. He's not there. Uh, I, okay. Okay. Yeah, hello. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the, the ICT team has a problem. So Professor Walton called me. I myself, I was off for some, some few minutes. But I, I guess that um, until he's able to join us, I think we can proceed uh, at this point in time. I don't know what is really happening at the institutes. Um, I, I, I think we should now move on. The, the um, other plenary presentations uh, by uh, Dr. Angus Christine and uh, Dr. Kiama Mugambi. Uh, maybe you can call uh, Dr. Angus Christine uh to to begin with his presentations um i can see others now joining uh angles if 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 you are you are um around you can join us dr christine is um working with um spck um is a member of the uh atmp african theological network press and then dr uh, Kiama Mugambi is the editorial manager of the African Theological Network Press. Today, they are making a presentation on uh, publications. Uh, so, Angus, if you are with us, you can begin right away. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for your introduction, and it's a great uh, privilege to be with you today and to uh, participate in your uh, discussions, this rich fair, which uh, I am greatly enjoying. And actually, I am going to hand over straight away to my colleague, uh, Dr. Mugambi, who is going to be steering us through our time uh, together. So, Kiama, over to you. Kiama, we can't hear you. Have you got your mic on? Yeah, your mic. We're not hearing you still, sorry. We're getting, uh, we can see you, but we can't hear you.
over joys of technology. Whilst um, uh, Dr. Mugami uh, is just having a go to see if he can uh, log back on again, let me just make a brief introduction about the uh, African uh, Theological Network Press. Uh, this is a, a publishing initiative that's come out of uh, a long series of conversations with uh, a number of uh, African institutions. Akrofi Christella has very much been at the heart of these conversations and graciously hosted a consultation for us back in 2016. The other key uh, African partner is Hakima uh, University College in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, the Jesuit Training uh, College and a long known center for African uh, Christian thought. Uh, and then in the UK, there is um, Missio Africanus led by Dr. Harvey uh, Quiani, now at Liverpool Hope. This is a network um, or among the diaspora uh, for uh, mission and theological reflection. And finally, um, SPCK, who is an, Ang is an Anglican mission agency with a long commitment to uh, theological and Christian publishing in uh, other parts of the world. And certainly as far as we're concerned, uh, this is an appropriate uh, initiative for 21st century where uh, the direction of African theological publishing is driven by uh, African theological institutions and is led by uh, Dr. Mugambi, uh, our editorial uh, manager. Now, Dr. Mugambi, are you with us uh, verbally as well as visually? No, we can't hear you still. So oh dear, this is uh, we are now being. Uh, Sorry. Are you there, Kiyama? We can see you, but we can't hear we can't, you. Yeah, we can see you, can't hear you. Um, and yeah, does, he have, does he have a presentation? Uh, we we've 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 got something which we've 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 worked on. Um, we were hoping, uh, though. Let me try and see if I can sort of um, start things going. Uh, we wanted very much Kiyama uh, to do this because he is uh, very skilled in this area. He himself has been on uh, the journey of uh, publication uh, himself with his own uh, doctorate. Uh, and so we uh, very much wanted him to uh, present. Um, but let me um, try and see if I can pick up and be a, a faint uh, echo of um, what we wanted to share. We circulated around beforehand a, um, a handout where we encouraged uh, participants to think about uh three uh questions and if i can share my uh screen i will uh get those questions up for you now right now can does that coming up can people see that you can see it. So these were the three questions. What are you researching? Who is the intended audience you want to communicate uh, your research to? How will you communicate your research to this audience? And uh, we would hope, please, that uh, members of... Me uh, ah, Kiyama. Yes. Are you there? Okay, that's that's good. Right, uh, Kiyama, we've got as far as um, got some questions. <laughs> okay, I, I that's said, fine. I said, do you, could could you hear me? Yes, when, I can hear you clearly. And could you hear me whilst I was talking previously? Uh, yes. So you know everything that I've said. I'm now going you... hand over to you <laughs> to take us forward from uh, this point. Whilst I've had to do a pale 
uh, uh, imitation of standing in for you? Well, um, that that is um, Angus, um, and I think uh, he he will say less of himself than uh, than I think he he should. Um, so three questions were were circulated, and uh, we hope to hear from uh, from especially the doctoral students uh, about those three questions. Uh, and I think the introduction has already been made um, uh, for Angus and 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 myself. I will add some important details um, that uh, might have been left out in the introduction. Uh, that uh, that uh, Angus is uh, married to Helen, and uh, and uh, they have three children uh, who are uh, uh, older now, looking at getting out of home. That is important for this African gathering. Uh, and Kiama Mugambi is uh, the husband to but one wife. Uh, it's important to clarify that. Um, uh, and and uh, we have three children and we live here in, in Nairobi. And Angus is joining us uh, from Oxford. So three questions were, were, were raised and some documents were circulated. I do want to mention something that was pointed out uh, by Auntie Mary today. Uh, about the uh, a small errata that does not change the content of uh, of uh, the review article that talks about uh, that talks about publishing in Africa, uh, and I just want to correct that and say that uh, ACI is not Presbyterian but Presbyterian founded, uh, and that uh, the book Jesus in Africa that's mentioned in the article for those of you who read it. Um, was first published by uh, Regnum Africa um, here, there in Ghana, uh, and not in the West, as I had uh, earlier mentioned. Um, so, so three questions were raised. We will come back to those three questions, uh, and I want to talk, uh, you know, in, in you know, in in a brief way. So we'll have a, a chat uh, about a, a few key points, and then we we'll want to hear from the doctoral students. Uh, and then we'll, I'm going to draw in uh, Angus from his experience uh, to talk to us uh, boldly uh, about some of the things that, uh, uh, some of the realities that we encounter. And so our talk is really about publishing. And um, even though we are talking about researching biographies, um, in my own writing, I've had to do biographical work. Uh, and in a, in a book that, uh, that I recently published, on uh, the history of Pentecostalism uh, here, uh, here in Kenya, uh, I had to do some uh, biographical uh, research. Uh, and I'm also connected um, as an international editor with the Dictionary of African Christian Biographies. And so that uh, makes this, uh, this seminar's topic uh, especially pertinent uh, for me, and I think for all of us. And, and publishing is a real, um, is one of the outcomes of uh, the, labor that we put in uh, to our academic work. So the questions that we we raised, uh, there were three questions. And the first is, uh, you know, what, what is your research about? And in this seminar, we are talking about, uh, about biographies. Uh, but the, the other question is, is uh, that as we research and eventually, you know, we'll, you know, produce a dissertation that is for a very small audience, um, often just the panel uh, that is examining it. But uh, we have to ask the question beyond that, who is going to benefit most from the findings of one's research? Uh, that's a question I had to contend with after I did my, uh, after I you know, finished and, and, and passed my, my PhD um, here in, at Africa International University in, in, uh, in Kenya. And then the third question is, what is the best medium to communicate uh, the key findings of your research? And I want to make a few remarks here uh, about, about uh, the best medium to communicate the research findings and then talk about a particular audience uh, and publishing uh, for that audience. Um, so, uh, you know, what when we talk about the best medium to communicate one's, uh, one's key findings of their research, uh, we, we have a wide array of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, publications that one could, uh, could you know, focus their research into. We have church manuals, 
So for example, we have, uh, you know, someone who created discipleship materials out of uh, some graduate, uh, graduate uh, studies uh, on discipleship um, here, in, here in, in Nairobi. Uh, people create books, you know, books for popular use or books for, for use by congregation members. Uh, a number of people uh, have turned, you know, their, their findings on family, for example, into marriage uh, and family uh, discipleship uh, documents. People could 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 uh, communicate their key findings in pamphlets or um, you know documents uh, to to put together curricula. Uh, but but the the thing that would concern us, for example, here in this uh, conversation is uh, is uh, the medium of academic publications. Academic audiences uh, usually will receive. Um, uh, publications in in two basic you know models uh over time journals we have academic journals and academic books both of these have very uh, specific audiences and in fact with journals or with books that come in in particular series uh, by by academic publishers uh, they have very specific audiences so when you when you you know work on your dissertation or work on your biography uh, then you have this you you are probably uh, uh, publishing within within world christianity or african history or african studies uh, if you want to publish in the west uh, or you know uh, um, the, you know ecclesiological journals or if if you're studying a particular kind of Christianity, for example, I, I am interested in uh, charismatic and Pentecostal studies. You know, you publish in in journals that uh, that that will publish in that particular area. So, so you know, with those two models, the journals or academic books, they're very is, is specific. Uh, there are limited number of publishers uh, who will uh, take that material, and the distribution is limited. So the number of people that you're talking about who will want your book and consider it important or want your publication and consider it important is very small. It's a sliver of the entire academic um, uh, uh, population. I want to make a quick mention here and say that uh, in the last few years, and, and I want to credit um, uh, Dr. Crichton for, for, for pointing this out, uh, a number of publishers are now considering uh, a third model, which is a hybrid or sounds like a hybrid between journals and academic books. Uh, and that is a small monograph. You know, journals would generally be 6,000 words to 10,000 words. Academic books tend to start from, you know, 70,000 words, uh, which, which is what AT&P, for example, has, has been considering an academic monograph. Uh, but there is an in-between um, kind of model that that would uh, it, it is now considering publishing uh, small books that are very concise and go straight into the argument and to the uh, research um, that are uh, no more than thirty thousand words. Uh, we can mention that in a moment. So academic audiences, you know, are very specific. There is limited distribution. Um, there is a, a, a certain demand for, for, for a high level of, of quality. You know, the writing, the style, uh, and, and the contribution of the material uh, to, to the, a particular academic field is, is, is uh, taken very seriously. Now, the books for academic audiences uh, or materials or journals uh, are generally used uh, for teaching and developing uh, further research, and I'm making, I'm being very general here, uh, but you know, within those two broad categories, there are different things that people would do. You know, with, with regard to teaching, you know, they can teach, they can be used for teaching, you know, undergraduates or you know, master students, uh, or you know, developing um, uh, doctoral work. Or sometimes uh, I have seen some material that is is published specifically for. Uh, postdoctoral uh, audiences, or very specialized, you know, just a few people, very people in very specialized uh, areas of a particular field. Uh, 
Uh, and the other side is uh, to to advance the discourse and and to develop further research or or to open new lines of inquiry uh, that can then be pursued by you know doctoral students or other uh, researchers. So the uh, once once um, choice of 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 the audience and choice of medium to communicate, of course, will. Uh, come out of what the research is about or come out of answering the question, what is this thing, uh, that, what, what is it that I'm trying to do and, and within which field of knowledge or, or you know, area of knowledge uh, does it come from? And who is going to benefit most uh, from the findings of, of one's research? Uh, I, I would like to, to give a few minutes now to hear from the doctoral students. Uh, I would like to hear from them what uh, you know um, what some of the students are are uh, are you know researching. What is the research about? And and uh, at this point, uh, who who do you think will benefit most from the findings of your your research, um, other than uh, other than uh, yourself and uh, and the panel that will examine you? So, if if we could have a few of the doctoral students uh, raise their voices, and uh, perhaps I should ask the the chair to moderate this for us. Uh, if the chair is there. Yeah, I've come back. Um, I, I lost connection, but I'm back now. So uh, let's see. Um, um, can, can Reverend Hansen start? Hello. Then, then, then um, uh, Eric, also, you, you can continue. Reverend Hansen, yes, you, you, you had a general question, yeah. Yes, Akrofi Hansen is my name, uh, Hansen, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. my work is on Pentecostal charismatism in the Ghana Baptist Convention, in the Ghana Baptist Convention, implication for ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, generally, that's what I'm researching on. And uh, as I work, uh, I've come across the evangelical antecedents of the Ghana Baptist Convention and the Pentecostal charismatic ethos in our country, and how it is buffeting um, the convention. I've also come across the uh, strict autonomy, because every Baptist church is supposed to be autonomous, as against uh, cooperation, they're cooperating to do the lost work together, and how this is also putting some pressure on convention. But generally, I just want to see how far the Pentecostal charismatic ethos has influenced the Ghana Baptist Convention. Thank, thank you. And who's, who's going to make benefit most from, in your view, from from what you what, what you find? Um, first, the Baptist community, because they they have a problem with this identity, whether they are Evangelicals or Pentecostals, and I guess it's a uh, it's quite universal among the um the evangelical churches i noticed that um the historical mission churches presby methodist and the rest of them they had to face that challenge at a point in time and they came up with the renewal movements so i guess it comes across uh, it's a tension that is ongoing between our background and what is happening and what how we can go about <laughs> doing it well I noticed that the Presbyterians and the Methodists, they've quite succeeded. So they have maintained their members through the renewal movement. So it will be good for any emerging church. Uh, I have started a new ministry, and though we are just five years, I realized that that challenge was coming up. How far charismatic should we be? So I guess it's an ongoing problem for uh, uh, churches all over. Great, thanks. OK. Yeah. Eric, you can you can share now. Eric Osiako too. Yes, sir. thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I am researching on spirituality and healthcare. Um, specifically, I'm looking at the practice and use of traditional herbal medicine by Christians, Muslims, and primary religious people um, in selected Akan, Ga, and Eve communities in Ghana. Um, I think that 
um, the audience beyond my um, supervisors and um, um, examiners. I think that generally Christians may be interested in reading my work. I'm also thinking that um, church leaders will also be interested in reading to be able to guide church members when issues arise on the choice of healthcare um, um, facilities um, 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 available. I'm also thinking that um, healthcare practitioners themselves, um, it might serve them um, um, really well to know the beliefs and and uh, especially the beliefs of, of patients about their health status, what they would opt for, and things like that. And also um, healthcare policy makers, particularly in, in our nation, for example, um, there is the national health insurance. And um, for, most, um, I'm, I, um, for most parts of, of what the national health insurance covers, uh, it excludes um, some traditional herbal uh, medicine practice. So I think that um, such a work would, would um, be a good read for them to see how some of those things can be rolled on onto mm -hmm. Great. Um, the areas they regulate. Thank Great. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Dr. Mugami, do you want others? <laughs> maybe one or two. One, maybe one other. Okay, Michael, Reverend Michael Naughty, can you help us? Yes, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Um, I'm researching on missions and conversions in Christianity and Islam. Missions and conversions in Christianity and Islam. And basically, I'm looking at how Christianity and Islam can be faithful to your missionary call and still maintain peaceful interreligious coexistence mm -hmm. and so that is the broad area i'm looking at mm -hmm. and i believe that this research will help both christian and muslim leaders to appreciate some of the human right concerns with respect to engaging in missions in these two religions mm -hmm. and also those who are interested in the field of Christian Muslim engagement mm. uh, can also benefit from this research in how uh, missions are undertaken in Christian dominated areas and Muslim dominated areas by either Christians or Muslims. Uh, mm. Why people, for example, go through some sense of persecution um, for the religious choices they make mm. in spite of the universal framework on the freedom of religions that uh, mm. Christianity and Islam subscribe to. Mm. So I believe that those who have interest in this field of um, religion and human rights, um, Christian-Muslim relations, and how to build peaceful interreligious societies will mm. benefit from this, this project. Mm. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thank you, thank you, Chair, for, for moderating that for us. This is very important work, uh, and, and uh, you know, I'm keen to hear, you know, a lot of these are areas uh, that, that I'll be very keen, you know, the, the Muslim uh, Christian uh, engagement. That's, that's uh, something that, uh, that we are very well aware of in East Africa, for example, uh, the, the, the question of, of uh, charismatization of, uh, of historic mission churches and so on um, is, is a subject that I uh, have spent a lot of time on uh, and, and uh, have written about as well. Uh, and, and also the question of health, uh, alternative health care uh, systems uh, and, and how Christians engage with that. So th these are important things. Uh, now, uh, allow me to be to be honest uh, here and talk about my own journey. Uh, when I uh, did my PhD and and finished, uh, I, I you know I spent uh, f four years of of really just hard work, research, uh, going into archives and 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 uh, retrieving information, interviewing people, transcribing a lot of material, participant observation, and spent four years of doing that. And at the end of it, I thought. 
um, like any human being would feel that I have uh, the knowledge that I have is uh, is is for the whole world, and and um, you know invested myself uh, in in uh, in presenting this knowledge to to other people, thinking that uh, you know publishers would be would be you know falling over themselves uh, for for this material. Um, I thought it was important material, and you know uh, it was important material. And so I did think, um, and 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 uh, you know, I spent some time after after my PhD trying to rewrite it into a book. And uh, and I learned a number of lessons, which uh, I'll be sharing, uh, you know, shortly uh, about that process. And would hope that this would be something that would help you, uh, even as I share a little bit about uh, from a perspective of now being an editorial manager of a publisher uh, here on the continent. But I think it is important for us to have a, an understanding. You know, uh, we we read books from you know Cambridge University Press, uh, Oxford University Press, um, you know some of the other you know Edinburgh uh, and so on, and uh, and would like to publish with them because we have something that we need to share or something that we want uh, to share. But how does that publishing world work? And this is where I want to bring in uh, Dr. Crichton to uh, come and share with, with us a little bit about uh, how. You know, publishing works um, on a on a global scale, and and give us some insight about uh, some of the uh, Western models and and uh, their implications for us as Africans uh, here. Uh, Dr. Bagambi, thank you uh, very much. Um, let me um, share a slide uh, with you. Um, which I will uh, work uh, uh, through uh, briefly. Um, let us go from uh, here. Um, so uh, there is a handout which will be uh, circulated afterwards, which uh, will expand on this in uh, much uh, more detail but essentially asks what happens if uh, we uh, decide to publish our research uh, in the Global North with a publisher uh, in, uh, in, in that part of the world. What does that terrain look like? And what do you have to be aware of? And this handout will uh, really go to, into that in really quite detail and at length is about 10 pages describing that. So this is just, really sort of five minute summary to uh, help you begin to work out what some of that uh, terrain is like. And the number one thing that I want to impress on you, that publishing in the Global North is shaped by Global North paradigms. It has to be. At the end of the day, publishers have to be business people. We receive manuscripts, we have to invest in them, uh, significant financial resources to turn them into a published book. It goes, the, your manuscript will go through a wide range of uh, stages which skilled professionals will work on, all of whom had, have to be paid to finally print uh, the book and for it to be sold. And publishers will only consider uh, books for publication if they think they can recoup their investment in one way um, or another. And uh, so if you work with a publisher in the Global North, it will be sh shaped by those paradigms of um, the Global North. So what is the audience that will be buying these books? Well, um, for Christianity, for uh, an African Christianity book, the primary audience will be world Christianity scholars, in academic institutions in the global north. Now, I don't need to tell the audience of the Crawford Cristela, but world Christianity is uh, a field of study that has developed um, uh, very significantly over the last um, 70 years. We have with us uh, one of the living ancestors of that pioneering uh, journey, uh, Professor Andrew Walls, and of course, uh, the uh, founding rector of ACI, Kwame Bediaka, was a very significant um, 
voice within that uh, growing uh, field. But it is still a relatively small field. So although it is growing and it is small, but, but small, that means that it is, from a publishing perspective, actually quite an overcrowded field. So lots of people wanting to publish in it because it is growing, but it is, is still new. It is still uh, uh, making progress and making inroads into the uh, established academic uh, communities of the global north. And therefore, the scope actually for publishing books where one can see a return on the investment is quite limited. And that therefore, there are only really some uh, publishers which will consider uh, world Christianity titles um, and um, the uh, publishing economics work out therefore that these books often uh, retail at uh, high prices because if the audience is small what uh, each um, book has to bear is a, a disproportionate amount of the costs for producing that book. And uh, in the handout, I will give you a worked example where you can see if I produce a book and I think I'm going to sell 200 copies and I produce a book and I'm going to produce um, a thousand copies, what the price of those two books has to be is very, very uh, different. Um, the one where you're only going to sell um, 200 copies uh, the retail cost would be about £50. If you can sell a thousand copies, that will drop down to about £12. So, if it's, so here you are, you want to publish your book, uh, World Christianity uh, Market, it's uh, burgeoning, but it's small, therefore you will sell small numbers of uh, books, and uh, the price of the books therefore will uh, be high. Um, that will mean that uh, everything about uh, this, uh, your, your title of publisher from Global will be shaped by these, these paradigms. The format that it takes, the price, the publication procedures, the, date, the debates will be shaped by that part of the world. And therefore, getting your scholarship uh, to be shaped by African uh, concerns is very much uh, secondary um, and you have to bear that in mind. The publisher's primary mar market is in the north, they are in the north, that is the market they can reach. Uh, therefore, if you do decide to proceed with a publisher uh, based in the global north, you will need to be proactive in making sure your scholarship returns to the continent of origin and I uh, outline in the handout uh, ways in which you can uh, do that. So that's just a very brief overview of uh, what will be in uh, the handout, which um, I will arrange with ACI to be uh, distributed to you afterwards. But that just gives you a brief overview of what this terrain looks like with publishers in the Global North. Dr. Mugambi, Thank back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Crichton. So um so our solution really lies in uh, in finding ways to publish uh, our material sustainably on the continent this is what uh, atnp exists to do uh it is what uh, regnum uh, africa have been doing for for years uh, in in west africa is what uh, cluster have uh, have done in, uh, in in southern africa for years uh, it is what Acton publishers have done in East Africa uh, for, for, for years. And so uh, AT&P um, is, is a network publisher and we uh, try to bring in the, the whole continent together, uh, bringing publishers together, bringing uh, resources together, uh, publishing some books for ourselves, but also uh, enhancing conversations like this one uh, so that we can begin to think more broadly uh, on the continent and more sustainably. I do want uh, to, uh, to make some comments uh, from what I, I have learned, as I promised a little earlier, before we open it up 
uh, for, for some questions. And I, I want to say, when you bring uh, your, your manuscript, let us say you found an African publisher, let us say you want to come to ATMP or Regnum Africa or, or uh, Cluster, um, but for purposes of this discussion, let's talk about ATNP. So the, you you need to to uh, tell the publisher what what your material is about, uh, and the way to do that is usually to put together a manuscript proposal, or in the US they sometimes will call it the prospectus, the manuscript manuscript of prospectus or book prospectus. And this is a document that you put together to, uh, as it were, sell your 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 content to to your publisher interest your content your, your publisher with your content and this this is a document usually to be a few pages long sometimes they will ask for a two-page document others will ask for a more elaborate document that would be five pages or ten pages uh, or not more than ten pages and it outlines what your content is about uh, it tells the publisher and usually the publisher will be someone who might not be an expert in the field uh, the person who reads it is not an expert in the field, but it is someone who has an understanding of what their audience is uh, as, as, a, uh, as a publisher, as a publishing co uh, company. And, and uh, your prospectus then tells this, this uh, gatekeeper or this, this uh, leader in the organization what your content is about and how it contributes, what, what is unique about it and how does it con contribute to the sphere of knowledge? And this is this is your opportunity to sell the unique point or to tell, let them know what the unique point of 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 uh, your content is. Uh, what are the key arguments uh, in your book? How do you lay your book out? How do you break down that argument in the chapters? Uh, and and what is uh, what is the specific audience? And as uh, as Dr. Kaiton has said, uh, you know, academic books will will have a very specific audience. Books from Africa will fit within um, as a small uh, part of, 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 of a wider field. I think some time back, uh, books, African history books, books uh, on African religion, uh, books on African Christianity in some universities will not even go to a world Christianity um, uh, audience. They'll go to an African studies audience which is a much broader category fitting together with other polit books on politics and economics and so on. So, so um, you know, your book proposal will talk about who your audience is. Uh, and if you're publishing a book here in Africa, then there are chances that, uh, that it is easier to segment your audience and to be able to know who, who will benefit from the book. And then you talk about the specifics of the manuscript. Is it is it ready? Is it nearly ready? How long will it take it take for it to be ready? How many words will it have? Uh, and you know, how many chapters does it have? Uh, is it going to have pictures? Uh, are the pictures going to be in color or black and white? Uh, and and those kinds of details. So that proposal, uh, uh, that proposal is a very important document uh, for several reasons. Number one, it helps your your publisher know what uh, what you're presenting and and why that is important. It also helps your publisher know what chances there are of making this sustainable. And this is very important for us here in Africa because the resources are limited. Very few publishers are endowed, if if any. Uh, and so publishers uh, oftentimes will have to uh, find funding for projects. Uh, or use whatever little resources they've gotten from other projects to fund uh, a particular project. And so it's important for them to know uh, whether this, but your, your project is going to, um, you know, cover for its own costs uh, at the very least. But the other thing about a book proposal is that it helps you see your book in uh, stark terms. And it tells you, uh, you know, even before you've sent your, your, your manuscript proposal to the, uh, to the publisher it tells you whether you have a good proposition you know do you have a good title is the title catchy i've seen some uh, conversations uh, on the chat uh, about you know possible titles you know will, will, will the title that you have given your book uh, interest uh, your audience or your target audience now these things are true for for academic uh, titles but also for for books 
for other use as well. You know, books for use within the church, books for training youth leaders, books for training, uh, you know, family uh, fa family workers, uh, and so on. Uh, books for training, um, you know, church leadership, like ecclesiological structures, and so on. Uh, so these these are important. It's a good discipline to get into. Uh, as I come to a conclusion, my my process, uh, you know, allowed me to see some of the gaps uh, that I had in my in my book, even as I presented my uh, my book proposal to a Western publisher. Now, I, I wrote, I think it was uh, eight or nine uh, manuscript proposals uh, for for different publishers, and out of uh, eight, eight the eight or nine, uh, only two accepted. Uh, accepted the, the 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 book proposal, uh, and and uh, one of them was was interested in seeing more material. So I sent I sent in some chapters and kept sending in the the chapters. Uh, but the book proposal was the first place where I was able to see how to arrange my material uh, in a way that was logical and a way that was useful uh, for people. And and so you know in just writing the manuscript proposal for myself, uh, I was able to. Uh, to rearrange the chapters uh, so that the the argument made more uh, more sense. My hope, as uh, as we share this, uh, is to help you begin to see uh, for yourself uh, what you need to do to get your material to the people that need it the most. Ultimately, uh, the the more specific your audience, uh, the more the more specific your audience is, or the more specific uh, you begin to think. Uh, more specifically, begin to think of your audience uh, for your book, uh, the better it will be for you. Um, even though there may be others who will be interested in the material, uh, it is important to know, you know who will benefit the most uh, from, from, from your material, and you can target your material towards them. Now, for many of you with doctoral work, um, you know, material may be helpful for, for leaders, it may be helpful for the church, there may be some, some things that will emerge out of it that will help uh, workers, uh, lay workers, but for some of you, your material is going to be very important for teaching purposes, and it's going to be very important uh, for uh, you know advancing new lines of inquiry and opening up new lines of research. And, and for for those for whom that will be true, you will need to consider putting together an an academic uh, uh, an academic book, even as you think of doing uh, publishing journals. Uh, I, I said I would come back to uh, you know to, to to new models that are coming up. These have not yet caught on, uh, but uh, you know publishers are now beginning to consider uh, shorter books that are very concise, uh, thirty thousand words. Uh, that that uh, and and Cambridge Cambridge have a, a model like that one. Uh, Oxford has a has a model like that one. I know of those two for now. Uh, I will not be surprised if there are few other. Um, a few other publishers who have tried working with smaller books. I know that Orbis also have uh, a number of smaller books uh, that uh, that are you know have something important to contribute, but uh, it's not necessarily said in seventy thousand words. It's said in half of that, and uh, and you know those are models that we are going to begin to see here on the continent. But my encouragement, especially for doctoral students, is to begin to consider what are you going to do with your knowledge. It is one thing to work hard. Uh, and put together your material uh, and pass your your your, uh, your uh, doctoral th examination, uh, but then you know we then become a part of a small uh, community of scholars who have a responsibility to the rest of Africa uh, to to share our knowledge. Um, I think you know I've given an overview, and uh, would like. Uh, Possibly to uh, to get back to the to the chair who could uh, uh, guide us on the next thing. Perhaps you know get some clarifications and then and then uh, field questions. Um, and would be very keen to hear uh, questions from uh, from from the doctoral students as well or others who have recently finished um, who uh, who would like to publish their work. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugambi. So, as he said, the floor the floor is open for clarifications initially, and then we can go on to other things. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Mugambi, um, can, yes. I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just start? So, supposing someone wants to publish, is there an upfront amount that he has to pay? Can you tell mm -hmm. a little bit about the process of funding? Yes. So, um, uh, uh, books that are published are funded in several different ways. The, um, the, the way we have in our, the, the, the way that, that publishing is done that we have in our minds uh, is that the publisher will come in uh, and foot the bill for the copy editing, foot the bill for, for the typesetting, and then foot the bill for the proofreading, and then pay, uh, pay for the uh, printing of the books and then uh, pay for the marketing of, of the books. And so that is uh, fully funded uh, by, by the publisher or by the press. Uh, and, uh, you know, Hello, Dr. Mugambi. We lost him. Let me put off the uh, uh, video. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, Am okay, I back? great. Uh, yes, you're back. Yes. So, so where, where, where the, the 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 printing press foots the bill in anticipation that they're going to be able to get back their money. Then there is the complete opposite, uh, opposite. Uh, um, model where uh, pu the publishers uh, rent out their um, their services uh, to to authors and and oftentimes they are called vanity uh, vanity publishers who where someone comes in with the, with their money and they they fund the entire uh, cost of, of of publishing their book uh, and and you know Like yeah, where someone where someone would pay for for the um, uh, uh, perhaps for the for the copy editing if there's some heavy copy editing uh, work that needs to be done, and then and then the the, the publisher would would fund uh, the rest. Uh, and and you know there are different variety of models. There are people who get funding, for example, from an organization because they are they are publishing in the interests of an NGO uh, and and so on. Uh, but to answer your question, with amongst all of those ways, um, and and uh, Dr. Crichton and I have have done uh, quite a bit of work reflecting. So, sorry, my, my internet keeps coming on and off, I'm not sure. But uh, the point I'm making is um, that, that uh, you know, we need to find ways to do uh, publishing sustainably, uh, and, and that requires a mix of, of, uh, of, of elements, putting together some elements to make sure that the books are, uh, are sustainable, that we print, uh, we print and put together books that we can sell and be able to fund from within uh, the continent. Thank you very much. In fact, there's a, a comment here that um, at &P has been set up to deal with the problem of distribution. Um, yeah, okay. Are there, are there any other um, comments, um, questions? Um, Yeah, uh, Chairman. Yes, Prof. Chairman. Yes, um, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Mugambi and uh, uh, Dr. Crichton. Um, uh, some of our um, people have uh, done um, some publications uh, quite recently. I would, I would want to hear their voice. Wife and Stork and others, Dr. Gezi, Dr. Sulisa, 
what was the experience? I know it took them quite a number of years, you know, for them to get the, these things through. What is the experience? Can they share with us, uh, especially those who are contemplating, you know, publishing? Yeah, thank you. Yes, we, we, are, we, we allow that, so. Um, okay, um, can I can come in? Say, yes, do. Uh, my work was on the Bible translation, and uh, I also serve on the board of uh, uh, SIL, so uh, they, was, they were very happy to, with the work and wanted to publish it, so they took the initiative. Uh, so, I, uh, so they took up and we have to work on the uh, thesis to make it readable, to make it uh, uh, publishable. And so that, so they took the whole thing, I didn't, uh, from the beginning to the end. All that I did was um, helping with the editors, uh, going with them uh, up and down, uh, asking me to clarify this, check on this, and all that. So uh, the funding and everything was done by them, and. Uh, so they are even doing the marketing and everything. So uh, that's, as uh, Dr. Mugambi said, uh, it was an organization. So they, ha they have that vested interest uh, to see Bible translation. And they found um, what, was, uh, what I did among two ethnic groups was like telling their story to the wider publicity. Uh, public, so they took interest in publishing that. Thank you. Dr. Gezi, you want to share? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I, well, I have some few personal concerns, uh, maybe by way of starting that I felt that as an institute, uh, we are a bit more uh, proactive, as it were, in encouraging uh, graduates to publish, particularly graduates who find themselves uh, as faculty at the institute. So in my case, I don't remember any conscious engagement on that part. So it was more of a personal initiative of course, encouragement came here and there, but I was hoping for a more deliberate institutional approach, and not just from individual senior scholars or colleagues. And so this publishing with Whips and Stock actually came as a suggestion from one of our adjunct faculty, Professor Tony Barcom. By that time, I had just finished, so I told him that, well, I was, after spending all these years, I wasn't so much uh, ready to go through editorial work to publish this. <laughs> so I needed some bit of rest. Uh, and this will come after four years uh, following the graduation that I'll, I'll pick it up again with him. And so through his contacts uh, with one at Rips and Stock, that was followed through. And of course, with the help of my supervisor, so a senior supervisor, and then uh, my academic mother, for that matter. The process of application and all uh, went through. I think with the stock, um, because of the series they have, and some other clause or benefits, for example, I think the ability to be able to reprint uh, in Africa, and now that slot is there. And so, that was a, uh, in terms of cost also, relatively um, cheaper. Dr. Blasu has also published with them. If he's online, he can also share his experience. But, th but that, that's, that's my um, little cry, I should put it. Uh, and I'm happy with ATMP because if there's such a collaboration with the Institute, then that cry for the institutional push, <laughs> a more conscious, uh, deliberate drive to encourage graduates to publish and uh, not to wait for a longer time. Uh, if that is there through ATMP, I think it's a welcome news. 
Uh, and good to see you, Kiyama, and to hear your voice. <laughs> It's good to see you, Dr. Gezi. Yes, in, in passing, that together with Angus, our meeting will certainly come on at some point. I've not forgotten about your request. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Dr. Gezi. So, uh, th thanks for sharing. Um, yes. Rob, did you have, uh, yeah, for Yes, up. Dr. Walton, yes. Maybe this is a concern I, I hope that uh, Kiyama can address. Maybe Dr. Crichton can also look at. Um, I, I deliberately wanted uh, some of our colleagues to share with us uh, the experience with uh, publishing because they both or the three of them have published with uh, Western publishers. We still have a problem on our hands because you see having access to copies is, 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 is the issue. And that's, that's, that's how, you know, at &P has been set up, you know, to navigate, you know, this problem because we are in Africa, um, the research has been done about Africans the books have been published in, you know, in the global north, and we don't have access to them. And sometimes, even if you do, they are expensive. Now, I'm, I'm thinking about um, um, cluster publications um, and some of the uh, publishing, you know, wings in, in East Africa and all that. But I'm thinking about, is it possible for us to uh, get them uh, published online, e-books, that that make them readily available and accessible of course you know people will say you know students once they download they may have problems you know maybe reading or all that but it is made available you know with very little expenses if you look at cluster publications for instance or what the university of utrecht in the, the, the centrum that they publish you know for their students uh, it is essentially the thesis very little is done by way of even uh, editing or something but it is made available so that students can make reference to it and uh, this situation of having to wait three four five years sometimes the book is never published at all you know i'm wondering whether that option is still available ebooks you know uh, where they can be made available readily accessible to begin with even if eventually we have in mind making paperback uh, uh, print of uh, uh, publications. Th thank you. That's a good. That's a good question, and it's a discussion that is uh, that is very much alive uh, with AT and P. Uh, I'll, I'll make I'll make uh, some quick comments and and invite uh, Dr. Crichton to say uh, to say a word or two. Uh, online publishing, uh, uh, you know, distribution, the the, the creation of eBooks. Uh, majority of the platforms that have been created uh, to distribute ebooks are uh, are actually Western platforms. Uh, the largest of them being uh, the Amazon platform, uh, the Kindle, the Kindle, um, the, the Kindle platform. Now, uh, assume that uh, let, let us say that that uh, uh, Kiyama has done his uh, his PhD and uh, he um, prepares his manuscript uh, to. Uh, to meet the standard of, a, of an academic book and uh, you know th there's a cost to that you know um, I don't know what one would put but uh, for example copy editing uh, can be uh, content editing and then copy editing and then typesetting uh, all of that you know the cost can accumulate let us say that uh, the cost is I don't know fifty five hundred dollars uh, one thousand uh, dollars of that uh, the challenge becomes if you convert it into, for example, a PDF, then uh, as soon as you uh, sell the first 20 copies or the first uh, you know, 30 copies uh, at, I don't know, $2 a piece, uh, then you find you, know, you have $60 and you have a balance of $940 in terms of cost uh, to the uh, co cost to the publisher or cost to the uh, to the author, depending on who uh, paid for that. So the one of the big questions that we need to answer here on the continent is uh, is how uh, digital the, the cost of digital distribution is uh, is covered. Now one could say, well, our PhDs are good good enough quality, and we can just distribute them as distribute them as they are. Uh, and you know there there are advantages to that because you can then disseminate them. In fact, different universities are now offering their uh, are offering PhDs uh, PhD theses uh, for open 
uh, open sourced. Um, the Jesuit Historical Institute in Africa has a thesis bank where you can find, uh, I forget now, I think it would be 800 or 900 PhD and master's thesis from all over Africa uh, on different uh, topics. So that's, uh, uh, you know, so that is already happening. So people are distributing that. But uh, but you also will agree with me that uh, work does need to be done uh, on PhD thesis to enable the uh, document that is written for a panel of, of um, you know, five or six uh, examiners and readers uh, to convert that into something that can be usable uh, in, in, in academia. And uh, the cost of that is what uh, digital distribution has not yet resolved. And it is something that we're looking at uh, as H&P. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I, think, I think, you know, the, uh, as we try to, to, to have those discussions, I was trying to figure out what are the models. And it could well be uh, that, uh, you know, we need to, to, to either find uh, lower cost models or uh, open source models of distributing um you know uh, of distributing uh ebooks uh but then uh, that that are able to to enable us to sell the ebooks e at a lower cost but also uh, sell e enough large enough numbers of them to make this sustainable and dr Crichton, what would you say i think i would um separate out two issues that uh prof has raised there one is what do we do about our african theological content that goes north and we can't get it back south because it has a northern publishing wrapper around it which is one um can be expensive too highly expensive i mean there are um compendia out there on african christianity that, whose retail price is 200 dollars mm. now that is unaffordable to any institute any individual i know of in the world and unaffordable to most institutions on the African continent. And yet it contains leading scholarship on African Christianity. How do we get that material back home? So that is uh, one issue. And then secondly, does how does digital help or not help? Now, with uh, the first issue, um, ATMP has made some uh, inroads in applying to uh, Global North publishers for the rights for Africa to some of those titles and that's something we are working on and the handout uh, that you will have access to has got advice in it if you do go the Global North route how can you ensure that your content comes back south so you can uh, follow uh, follow that up secondly I think um, uh, Dr. Mugambi has already made, a, I think, a very important um, distinction with digital publishing. So, uh, Prof, when we talk about, uh, say, theses by students from ACI, if we're saying we want the thesis to be available, well, in that case, as it stands, once the student has completed it and submitted it and it's been passed and so forth, then yes, that could go into an open access digital repository. Uh, there are a number of them, institutions have them, there are Africa-wide ones, freely available. Okay, the cost of running that has to be sustained by an institution, um, but there is not the uh, investment in terms of um, sifting uh, through what's, what's gonna be published, what's not, uh, editing, copy editing, uh, typesetting, and so forth. None of those bills have been incurred, as Dr. Uh, Magambi has uh, indicated. As soon as you get into those kind of publication bills, you need some kind of cost recovery mechanism. And that either has to be the author pays for it or the user pays for it. And the challenge then of digital is to develop an effective cost recovery mechanism. So although digital saves massively in terms of print costs, and distribution costs, it still incurs the same pre-print costs as any print title would. Thank you very much. Um, may I say that um, the time is, is four minutes after two, but we don't always have AT&P and we have technical problems at the beginning. So 
I would plead the indulgence of all of you would go to a maximum of 215 and then it would close. Um, Prof, Prof Walls, is your hand up or this was the old one? Okay, I think this, this is the old. Uh, it, is ah, okay, the old yeah, yeah. it is the old one, but, uh, okay. uh, but perhaps I could just say, say one thing. Uh, and uh, Dr. Crichton uh, made at the beginning the point that publishers are in business to sell books. Uh, the doctoral thesis is not in itself to produce uh, a readable book. The doctoral thesis is part of a long process of apprenticeship to the scholarly life. You learn the ways and uh, the, uh, the, the, the difficulties and the uh, go through a whole series of exercises uh, to prove that you're learning the trade. Uh, so, at the end, it's not too surprising if what you have produced, yes, meets all the requirements of the examiners, but it doesn't pr uh, produce a book which a publisher thinks he can sell to a readership of people who really want to read this. Uh, so I think we've got to be prepared uh, for a second stage after the production of the thesis is making it readable, making it reader friendly, making it interesting, uh, taking, the, taking the reader through, forgetting examiners and thinking of uh, you can't uh, forget academic, uh, that uh, m many of your readers will be academic people who will expect academic standards and academic correctness. But uh, you have also this responsibility to get people to want to read it. Uh, because it's important, because you've got something to say. and it should also have a flow, should be able to take the reader along. So I just make the, make the plea that um, we think while we're doing this academic and scholarly writing of readers and of making it readable and of wanting to share with other people uh, what uh, truths that we see coming to ourselves out of our work. Um, the more we can do that before the thesis is, um, uh, is presented, the better. So I would plea that we just think uh, all the time of readability in everything that uh, everything that we're doing. And it does mean also that there may be a gap between the <clears throat> successful presentation of a thesis and the production of a readable book. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we are leaving out MTH dissertations in all of this. I guess they can also develop theirs um, in another way. All right, um, Hansen, Akrofiansa, can you? Yes, sir, Dr. Walton, thank you very much. I'll make it very brief. I think Prof. Andrew Walls has spoken my mind because I remember uh, Dr. Mugambi said, uh, out of those who write might emerge teachers. People who just want to reduce um, the high sounding theological arguments 
into simple ones which the lady can follow. So as he was presenting, I was just wondering whether this is just about academic uh, books or any other topic that somebody who is a teacher, somebody who is a writer, things can be uh, prepared and sent to the ground roots. The, the grassroots is also acceptable by ATMP. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like I mentioned a little earlier, uh, ATNP um, has has devoted itself to a very specific uh, uh, audience. Uh, we have, um, uh, you know, academic theological um, uh, um, audience. We we do our books really for people who are um, uh, for institutions and 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 for studies. And we have even even within academia, we have some very specific areas uh, that we look at you know theology and christianity and contemporary issues uh and and so on so so that for us uh is the audience that we devote ourselves to uh and it is uh, where we believe we can be able to connect with our um with our audience thank you uh Aaron Hansen. i think that we are about done with them um, all those who want to share. Um, if there is no one who has something burning on his heart or her heart, then we'll be drawing the curtain uh, on today's uh, program. So, um, Dr. Mugambi, can you yes. um, give, give your concluding remarks? Uh, maybe also uh, Dr. Angus. Well, th thank you so much for having us. Uh, uh, on 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 this uh, on this program, our our uh, uh, our hope uh, at the end of this is that uh, anyone who has some material that is publishable, uh, that has some knowledge that is out there to be shared, that that you would put in some work uh, to en enable the material to be shared uh, with others. Uh, I, I I take uh, seriously and very reverently the the advice given by. Uh, Professor Walls, who I'm so happy to see uh, here, uh, that that it is important for us to make our material readable, and uh, we have devoted ourselves as ATNP to also talk about that and say what can we as Africans who are speaking English for me, which is a you know fourth language, um, what can I do uh, to to make sure that my material is clear uh, without losing my African identity, and so we have. Uh, we need to be thinking about that as we think about making our material available. Dr. Crichton. I think I would like to uh, echo those uh, comments. Say it's a great privilege um, to uh, be uh, with you and part of uh, these discussions. And uh, we would uh, both welcome the opportunity to support and encourage uh these kind of publications to that above all will be available in africa for africa for the benefit and service of the church and the mission of god there as well as a benediction to the church and to the wide uh, to the wider world so that is very much what we are committed to um at atmp and which i pursue in my role at sbck so thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Angus. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mugambu and AT and P. Thank you for all the uh, piece of information and the advice that you've given to us. All right. We thank God for the day, beginning with uh, Dr. Ehenir Cho. Uh, but even before then, the refreshing devotion by Dr. Settles. Dr. Ehenir Cho was on the science of archival reconstruction. And we learned quite a lot from the struggles that she went through uh, in the composition of the biography of Reverend Theophilus Okoku. And then Auntie Koklu gave us a, a bit on funeral brochures on, and what we can glean from them. And we've just had the presentation from ATM. It's been a good day and we thank God for all that uh, he's given to us to choose this day. We will be asking 
Professor Thomas Udru, President of the Good News Theological Seminary, to give us the closing prayer. Prof. Udru. Hello. Yeah, Prof. Do you hear me? We, we, okay, we, we can hear pray. you. Thank you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for calling us into the Ministry of Theological Education and all that matters in our Christian work. Thank you, Lord, for granting us the opportunity to meet via this means to talk about the ministry. Thank you also for granting others the privilege and opportunity to take the lead and to lead us in through the paths of scholarship. We pray that Lord, you bless us and continually bless Acrofi Christola Institute and all the lecturers and professors and students and donors so that we will continually be briefed on the work. We bless your holy name in Jesus, Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you very much. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 And so uh, <laughs> should I say that tomorrow tomorrow is the last day. Um so we continue tomorrow. Is it